coming from Chicago, Illinois, Norris, and Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, one day, you all will be able to say you were in the same room with Professor Miriam Petty. I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening, or this afternoon, and to thank Bill Gaskins, Karen Kuoni, and Alyssa Phoebus for organizing this panel, doing all the work that it took to bring us all here, uh, and for imagining that we could and should talk through these complicated issues of race, representation, popular culture, history, and the contemporary moment. And I'd also, of course, like to thank all of the other speakers um, in, this, in, this, in this panel. Uh, I'm looking forward to our roundtable conversation. As I prepared for today, I was reminded actually of a similar panel discussion at Princeton University this past November that was organized the day after Barack Obama's historic election. In particular, at that panel, I remember being struck by Farah Jasmine Griffin's comments, her comment that uh, the, uh, the failure of reconstruction is part and parcel of the reason that the election of an African-American president, a Barack Obama, was so long delayed in American political history. And I quote her, 
there was such a possibility in Reconstruction, and had we not had its brutal, violent failure, the election of Barack Obama would have not been, would not have been such an extraordinary moment. Now, co coincidentally with today's panel, I've actually been watching and teaching the birth of a nation over the last two weeks with my students in Rutger, at Rutgers and have been considering its significance as a cultural monument to the state of mind that killed off Reconstruction and then figuratively danced on its grave some 40 years later with bl birth's blockbusting release. So in my remarks today, I'm gonna touch upon some of the ways that Birth's fear-mongering anticipates contemporary racial paranoia, and then briefly consider the significance of history and of change in our understanding of this film. I definitely would like to thank uh, David Blight and Michelle Wallace for laying out such a great uh, comprehensive context. I feel a little more, more comfortable in getting a bit more specific in my conversation about Birth. The threat and suppression of African-American political power so central to the birth of a nation's narrative is personified in a number of different representatives in the film. Perhaps most frequently, viewers take note of Gus, the fearful renegade who apparently chases Flora Cameron to her death in the second half of the film. Griffith first introduces Gus to us in an intertitle as a product of the vicious doctrines spread by the carpetbaggers. When Gus approaches Flora, he seems to base his terse proposal of marriage upon his improving social position. He's a captain now, he explains, and he wants to marry. Likewise, Silas Lynch, who Griffith characterizes in an intertitle as the mulatto leader of the blacks, is emboldened by his ascension to Austin Stoneman second in command, and then later to Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina, so much so that he, become, he comes to imagine the film's idealized white ingenue, Elsie Stoneman, as his, as his intended, and attempts to force her into marriage. But the woman you just saw here, Stoneman's housekeeper and his eventual paramour, Lydia Brown, is less often remarked upon, even though she is ultimately the key to all of the later power moves that we see made by Birth's bad African Americans. You saw the inner title here where Griffith lays all of Stoneman's pro-black sentiment squarely at the feet of his weakness for Brown. And it is Lydia Brown, by virtue of her inappropriately elevated status, who introduces Stoneman to the power-hungry mulatto protege that we meet later, Silas Lynch. Whereas black men like Lynch are portrayed as using their advancing positions as the opportunity to press a sexual power advantage over white women. By a, in the converse, we have Lydia Brown who exploits her own sexuality to facilitate her social and political advancement. There was a little bit more to the scene, to the clip, where basically Lydia sort of, you know, bears her shoulder kind of on accident and Stoneman is sort of enticed by it and the scene really ends with his arms around her sort of comforting her uh, in the wake of this whole situation. Um, and so she essentially fabricates a tale of sexualized assault at the hands of Stoneman's friend and political associate Sumner. She successfully uses this lure, this, this lie, as a sexual lure and as a kind of erotic fantasy for Stoneman. And in turn, she establishes herself as his mistress. And so with the shift in power that follows Lincoln's assassination, Stone's, Stoneman's home becomes the de facto White House. Though its honor is fully marred, both by Stoneman's own warped ideological position and by the defamatory presence of Lydia Brown, Stoneman's black first lady. From Griffith's perspective, Brown's place of honor beside the grotesque Stoneman is a cynical visual joke. There's Stoneman on the one hand with his bald pate and his club foot, um, and he's really a mockery of manhood. He's, he's less than a man. By his side, we have Lydia Brown with her, her, her airs and her pretensions and her violent passions, throwing herself on the floor and spitting at the door. All of this makes her a mockery of the kind of femininity that's idealized in the film and folks like Elsie and Margaret Cameron. So together, Austin Stoneman and Lydia Brown are really meant to sim symbolize America's true degradation 
during the Reconstruction era. Equally important, however, is Berth's notion that the joke is ultimately on Stoneman as the white radical who encouraged the flourishing of black power and ambition. As I've mentioned, it is Lydia Brown who first ushers Silas Lynch into Stoneman's chambers. And the film really carefully, um, carefully underscores Lydia's investment in Lynch's success. When she brings him in, this is the first time we've ever seen Silas Lynch, but it, it's very clearly established that the two of them know each other. They sort of go into a huddle together and talk together before Lynch is admitted into Stoneman's chambers. And then Lydia has this moment of private rejoicing and exulting when Stoneman says, I intend to lift you up to be the equal of any white man anywhere. So, we have this sham partnership between Lydia and Stoneman, and then we have the real partnership that exists between Lydia and Silas Lynch. And the ambition and kind of secret scheming that constitute that partnership is what truly drives both of these characters. What Stoneman won't understand until the film's end, when the black Lynch wants to use his newfound equality to marry the white Stoneman's daughter, and what the birth of a nation suggests unrelentingly is that white humiliation and degradation are the only possible outcomes of African-American equality and political power. This Manichaean logic in which power cannot exist without suppression, in which black and white cannot coexist without one being subdued by the other, fairly pervades birth, both thematically and visually. And it's these latter threatening aspects of African-American political leadership that Birth of a Nation really conjures for me in the current social and political climate. That is to say, in terms of a leader like Barack Obama, in terms of his candidacy and his short presidency, the aspects of them that have seemed the most threatening from a mainstream perspective have been those that even tenuously suggested his collusion with a sinister black agenda or, vengeful, or, or a vengeful plot against white America. So it's this that made a figure like Reverend Jeremiah Wright with his thundering religio-political critiques of American racism and imperialism polarizing in the extreme. This is what made Michelle Obama's straightforward assessments about her status as a guest at an Ivy League institution in the age of Reagan or the paucity of pride she felt able to muster in her country as a black woman, so unnerving. Moreover, simple acts of affinity and rapport between black people can be read in this light to suggest get whitey levels of secrecy and collusion between blacks. So, for instance, Michelle and Barack Obama's playful fist bump at last summer's Democratic National Convention was interpreted at heights of great absurdity among these sorts, along these sorts of lines. Now, the publicity in my directive today for our discussion suggests that we would consider the birth of the nation in the context of the Obama call for change. For my own interest and focus in film history, doing so also means recalling, as Michelle Wallace suggested, the historical context wherein the birth of a nation itself prompted significant protest and calls for change. And so we have, for instance, this response from black communities, specific protests and responses um, from black activists. Without a doubt, part of what outraged many black moviegoers who saw The Birth of a Nation was Griffith's labored insistence, both within the film and beyond its frame, that this movie represented a rigorous, historically accurate picture of the Civil War and Reconstruction eras. Many of you saw on the screening the mo in this morning that within the film, the viewers treated to a lot of intertitles that quote from the Lost Cost Histories and Dunning School Histories that uh, David Blight mentioned, or also proclaim certain scenes as historical facsimiles. And this is, I don't know if this is a term that Griffith made up on his own. I've never seen a film that says, you know, makes those sorts of proclamations. Um, and Griffith's intertitle in verse really fo function like footnotes in a scholarly work to verify the facts being presented. Griffith 
personally contended that Birth of a Nation was an example of the way that the film medium was ultimately destined to radically, radically transform and deform the teaching and learning of history. So in a 1915 interview, he posited the following scenario, and I'm gonna quote him. Suppose you wish to read up on a certain episode in Napoleon's life. Instead of consulting all the authorities, waiting lab laboriously through a host of books and ending bewildered, without a clear idea of exactly what did happen, and confused at every point by conflicting opinions about what did happen, you will merely seat yourself at a properly adjusted window in a scientifically prepared room, press the button, and see what happened. There will be no opinions expressed. You will merely be present at the making of history. The time will come in less than 10 years where the children in the public schools will be taught practically everything by moving pictures. Certainly, they will never be obliged to read history again. And my students certainly hope that that day is coming. <laughs> but the notion that birth contained the unequivocal truth about this particular historic era certainly angered and disquieted many black moviegoers and movie makers and black filmmakers used their art as another means of protest against the ideas that were presented in birth. Yet, it was really difficult for most black movie makers and production houses to, to imagine responding to the film directly, because attempting to replicate it, its unprecedented and mammoth scale would have been cost prohibitive. Instead, black filmmaking concerns like the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, the Hunter Haynes Film Company, the Michaud Book and Film Company, and the Foster Photoplay Company made race films that mobilized key themes intended to foster racial pride and to undermine and undercut the totalizing racist vision of America that Griffiths championed on such a massive scale in The Birth of a Nation. Nor were these race films simply reactionary to The Birth of a Nation. As birth entered the national consciousness, race films were already evolving as an important genre for movie-going black audiences. My friend and colleague Jackie Stewart argues that two of the most important themes for these early black filmmakers were migration and patriotism. And these are sort of themes that we wouldn't see in a film like Birth whatsoever. On the one hand, the theme of migration lends itself to exposing the varying conditions and opportunities awaiting African Americans in different regions of the country, from the south, moving from the, usually moving from the south to the north, but also moving from the south to the west. Exploring black migration also allowed filmmakers to emphasize black people's right to their own mobility and autonomy during an era that saw a major re redistribution of African Americans from rural to urban spaces. Alternatively, the theme of patriotism and black military service provided blacks with an opportunity to make the case for their citizenship by illuminating their willingness to sacrifice their lives through participation in the nation's armed conflicts. And so a film like Oscar Micheaux's 1920, Within Our Gates, which many film scholars acknowledge as an essential and intentional response to the birth of a nation, actually touches on both of these themes in its plot. Moreover, in res with respect to the clip that you saw at the beginning, Within Our Gates features a, a mixed race black protagonist, Sylvia Landry, who I would argue is intended, intended to controvert Birth of a Nation's Lydia Brown, the character that you saw at the beginning there. Within Within Our Gates, Sylvia's life story complicates and contradicts Lydia's sexually charged lies and deceits by exposing the historical truth of black women's vulnerability to rape and sexual assault at the hands of white men. And specifically, Michaud creates a sequence in which Sylvia is attacked by a white man in a very unambiguous fashion. There's not all of this swooning that we see with Elsie Stoneman where she's sort of falling out and fainting. Sylvia fights to save her life and to save herself. Um, and more importantly, we see the truth of what actually happens to Sylvia instead of seeing her tell a lie about it in order to manipulate someone. In terms of its place in cinematic and cultural history, The Birth of a Nation is a film and a cultural artifact often described in terms of a litany of firsts and mosts. These include its status as the first American movie to run around 180 minutes and consist of 12 reels of film, 
the first film, as Michelle mentioned, with its own specially composed score, the first movie ever to be shown at the White House, and the most profitable film of its time, making it the first American blockbuster. For film scholars, it is also the film, first film that skillfully makes use of multiple conventions of film form, like parallel, parallel editing, irises, night photography, color tenting, all of these inaugurating a style of visual storytelling that would become inextricably associated with classical American cinema. Yet, as cultural historians like Michael Rogan and Clyde Taylor remind us, Valorizing, valorizing the birth of a nation's aesthetic achievements to the exclusions of its mythic white supremacist meaning effectively diminishes the film's significance as a whole. Birth's innovative technical moves could not have been as powerful and effective as they were had they not been connected to some of this country's most potent anxieties and, as Bill points out, its most potent myths. Birth's continued resonance certainly owes as much to its power as a cultural touchstone as it does to its status as a landmark in film style. Thank you. Uh, with all due respect to my academic colleagues on the panel, some of the most interesting, compelling historical writing is being done outside of the academy and uh, by journalists. And perhaps one of the most disruptive as well as compelling reading experiences I've had of late uh, has been my reading of Slavery by Another Name, written by Donald Black I mean Douglas Blackman, who uh, is here to conclude the panel. Douglas? Thank you, uh, and I'll cue my clip in a, after I've spoken for a few minutes. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, it's dangerous for someone like me to, uh, to, to spend an afternoon in the presence of serious scholars. I'm uh, very risky. They may turn on me at any moment. Uh, but, uh, but it is great to be here, and it's great that uh, my book, which came out last year, Slavery by Another Name, uh, seems to have helped to illuminate some things in persuasive ways. Uh, and gotten the reception that it has, including, to my astonishment, the Pulitzer Prize. But, um, which also begs the question of uh, why would a white guy from Mississippi uh, who works for Rupert Murdoch <laughs> at the most conservative newspaper in America write such a book? Uh, and, but that's a, that's a more complicated uh, topic. But the premise of my book, for those very few of you who have not yet read it, um, <laughs> uh, is that... Uh, uh, the, there were a lot of other things also going on uh, in the prelude uh, to Birth of a Nation in 1915, in addition to all of the things that have been so, uh, so well uh, characterized and explored already today. Um, and I argue that, that in toto, th those other things added up to a very concerted effort by American society to reinstitute slavery. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, in sub the subtitle of my book is The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II. Um, and and what I discuss in the book is that in, immediately after the Civil War, uh, another aspect of the Reconstruction period and sort of the larger period of time that, that we, we sort of lump under the Reconstruction title, um, but that, that at the beginning of that time, we forget that there was a period of very authentic freedom, uh, that the four million slaves who were emancipated at the end of the Civil War were in fact freed. Uh, and depending on where they lived in the South, uh, and exactly what period of time we talk about, um, the emancipated slaves, um, many, many uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of them separated themselves from the white people who had enslaved them uh, and built independent lives. Very difficult, harsh lives, poverty-stricken lives, lives uh, which obviously in which they were denied access to information, uh, to, to education and resources and, uh, and the mechanisms of American opportunity that, that white people um, like my ancestors were uh, had access to, but nonetheless, actual citizenship and real participation, uh, and that uh, contrary to the lessons of the Dunning School, uh, as has been well covered here, uh, that, that that period of black po political participation, uh, while, while messy and complicated uh, and fraught with conflict, uh, was legitimate, uh, and in fact, as David uh, um, made the point earlier, uh, never really represented the kind of, uh, of African-American dominance of Southern political life 
um, that the mythology came to embrace and the birth of a nation came to embrace. Um, but I make the argument in my book uh, that after a period of time uh, that in some places extended up into the 1880s and the 1890s, uh, that, that after this period of time in which many, many African Americans lived lives of actual independence and a form of real freedom, uh, that then this terrible shadow that has been described in many ways here already, this terrible, terrible shadow began to fall across black life, uh, particularly in the rural South. Uh, and that shadow was uh, the, the, the creative aspect, the artistic, if you will, aspect of that, and the propagandistic aspect of that shadow has been well covered by the other panelists, uh, but there was an economic aspect to it as well uh, in the, that was rooted in a very simple fact, and, that, and, and I do approach this as a writer and as an independent historian, uh, but also uh, very much so as a financial journalist uh, from the perspective of the Wall Street Journal, um, and that is that a very simple thing, very simple reality, and that was that white people in the South were addicted to slavery, and, and as an extension of that, the American economy as a whole was addicted to slavery. Um, at the end of the Civil War, whites in the South simply could not figure out how to resurrect a cotton-based economy without access to four million forced laborers. It's not a terrible, su terrible surprise, really, that they didn't know how to do that. Uh, they, they knew when to put the seed in the ground. They knew uh, when, to, when, the, when the weeds needed to be chopped. They knew, obviously, when the cotton needed to be picked. Uh, but how to accomplish that uh, without access to four million forced laborers was beyond the grasp of most whites in the South. Uh, and so a lot of the economic struggle of the Reconstruction period was about that very issue. Uh, and it became very apparent in the white South and apparent to the rest of the country very quickly because the national economy relied in many respects uh, on a resurrection of the southern economy and, and a return of, of massive cotton production uh, to, to restore the, 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 the mechanisms of the national economy, it became very apparent to many white people very quickly that some form, some restoration of forced labor had to occur in the South. Um, at the same time, there was also this very, uh, th th this other uh, uh, primary need of the white South, uh, and that was to force African Americans out of the political process to end the, this period of citizenship which they enjoyed, and particularly in places where African Americans at that time held numerical majorities in terms of the population. There really weren't all that many of them, uh, and they were, they were dense, the, the, the places where there was a numerical majority. Uh, that there's sort of a perception that everywhere in the South, uh, the freed slaves had a numerical majority over whites, and that wasn't the case. It was the case in some states, and it was the case in particular places in, in states. Uh, but, the, but there was a desperate need uh, on the part of uh, of whites to end the citizenship of African Americans. And so that, that led to a sort of nexus of two incredibly powerful forces, one economic and one political, uh, so that the, the re-enslavement of African Americans and the terrorization of African Americans so that they would then abide by other, uh, less involuntary coercive measures, uh, the, that the, so to terrorize them through the new slavery was a mechanism of also forcing them out of the political system. Uh, and so my book, uh, my book makes the case that that happened, uh, um, uh, and I hope persuasively, um, and, but, and, that, and that this happened not just in an isolated way, that it didn't just happen in certain places and certain uh, grave ways here or there, but that it happened on a massive scale, uh, that all across the South, all across the slave counties of the South, where there were large populations of African Americans, that almost everywhere in the rural areas of the Deep South, that huge numbers of African Americans were compelled back into one kind of involuntary servitude or another. And by that, uh, I don't mean a difficult life. I, I, don't mean a, uh, uh, I don't mean that the fact that they didn't get to vote meant they were slaves or that, uh, that they were treated unfairly in their business dealings. I mean slavery. I mean the buying and selling of human beings. Uh, there was a brick factory on the outskirts of Atlanta, the city where I live now, called Chattahoochee Brick that was owned by the, the mayor of the city and really the man who was the father of modern Atlanta at the turn of the century and, and who in fact was a very prominent official in the city at the time Birth of the Nation was screened there. Um, uh, but his brick factory was uh, a, a place that produced um, three to five million bricks a month. 
uh, almost all of which were then purchased by the city of Atlanta or the builders of Atlanta for the reconstruction of the city. Hundreds of millions of bricks were made there. I live in a house built in 1906, almost, and I know for, for a fact that the sidewalks in front of my house, the, the brick streets beneath the asphalt uh, of the street that I live on, and the, the blocks and blocks all around me, those were all bricks made by 100% slave workers at Chattahoochee Brick. Almost certainly those bricks are in the foundation of my home and in the chimneys of my house. And so these are literally the bricks that we stand on as a city and as a society. Um, all of those bricks were made by slave laborers decades after what we have believed to be the end of, of slavery. And on Sunday afternoons out at Chattahoochee Brick back in 1903 and 1905, white men would come out to the brickyard uh, and say they wanted to acquire a black man. And guards would bring three or four black men out from the stockade and they would bargain prices and they sometimes would trade men back and forth. It was a regular occurrence on Sunday afternoons. And these kinds of, these kinds of, of activities happened in places all across the South and ultimately circumscribed the lives of thousands and thousands and thousands of African Americans. And so that's the economic sort of backdrop to these political and artistic uh, uh, aspects of American life in this period of time that lead up to, to birth of a nation. Uh, and Thomas Dixon, the writer that you've heard sort of referenced less today than, than D.W. Griffith, uh, was a great, uh, a great voice of, of the ideology that was necessary to provide some sort of rationale and, uh, uh, and, and cover for what was actually happening at, uh, through all of this time. And in many respects, Birth of a Nation, because it was so early in filmmaking, because it's so fundamental and seminal, literally seminal, in terms of, of full-length features, uh, it's sometimes misunderstood, in my view, um, as being a, a sort of singular event, that almost as if it's the beginning of a way of thinking. But as I think uh, Professor Blight um, well put it, uh, it really is not. It's a, it's a product of a long period of movement toward, uh, toward the expression of these ideas, uh, both politically, uh, but, but also in terms of, of art and creative effort. And Thomas Dixon was very much so um, uh, one of the spines of, that, of that, that thread of American creative effort. He wrote a series of novels beginning in the 1890s, some of which have been referenced here. Uh, the, two, the two most important ones with regard to Birth of a Nation were first the leopard spots, and I think you can imagine what that is referring to, the inability of one to change the leopard spots uh, being the, the point of that book, uh, that novel, and then in 1905 he came out with The Klansman, uh, and in fact the first title of Birth of a Nation was The Klansman, um, and then after it initially premiered in New York and a few other places, uh, they changed the title to Birth of a Nation. But, the, but those two novels, before Birth of a Nation, uh, Dick, they, they were huge, huge successes. Probably the, uh, uh, the most successful uh, published works uh, in America uh, other than the Bible since Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, we, we don't really have good numbers on exactly how many of those books were sold, but millions and millions of them were sold in all parts of the country. And Dixon was from North Carolina, but he was also a New Yorker all of his adult life. He was back and forth between New York and North Carolina. He was the pastor of one of the biggest churches uh, in New York at the end of the 19th century. Uh, he was a very prominent figure here and in the South, and which is also illustrative of another aspect of all this, is that Birth of a Nation was not about uh, how racist people in the South were. It it's really about, it's really a manifestation uh, of how by the beginning of the 20th century, there was no substantial white constituency anywhere in America that was still ready to go through any significant amount of sacrifice or effort uh, to preserve citizenship for African Americans. Nowhere in the country were there whites uh, who in substantial numbers really believed uh, that full citizenship should be accorded to African Americans. And so Dixon really represented that. But after the huge success of, of these two novels, he then forged them, he took the novels and made them into a stage play, uh, which was also called The Klansman. Uh, and that stage play is very much so what Birth of a Nation is based on, though there's some dispute over uh, exactly how much it's rooted in, in the play, The Klansman. Uh, but I believe, and I won't claim to be a film scholar, but that's never stopped me from taking a position on anything else. Um, but from my viewing of uh, A Birth of a Nation many times, uh, 
the, in, the specific influence of Dixon, I think, is very clear. Uh, in, and it very much so, I mean, it is, it's also Griffith's film, certainly cinematically it is his film, but thematically uh, and in terms of the messages and particularly the, the, the profound ideological uh, and powerful ideological points that it works hard to make, I see Dixon all through it, uh, and it really does reflect the construction of the Klansmen in these earlier novels, which were grotesque white supremacist novels, I mean, grotesque in the absolute extreme. Uh, and the idea that they sold in the massive numbers that they did, I mean, Dixon was really the John Grisham of 1905 in, in terms of his commercial success. Uh, and so the idea that, uh, that such a writer with such ideas was so dominant um, in, on the popular literary um, landscape of American life is, is fairly shocking to us by today's standards. But so Dixon is all over this, all, all over this film. One, one side note I'll make, uh, which is a, uh, a meaningless coincidence in reality, but, but it is so astonishing to me that it cannot be meaningless. Um, and that is that the main character in Birth of a Nation, Ben Cameron, who's referred to often as the little colonel, but the Confederate colonel, son, the oldest son of the Camerons, um, that, that role was played by an actor whose name was Henry Walthall. Um, and to my amazement, as I was working on my book for many, many years, uh, I, I had an interest in the, the part that Birth of a Nation had played in terms of the propaganda and the cultural milieu of, of the very beginning of the century. Uh, but along the way, I was astonished to discover uh, that Walthall, this actor, was in fact also an active character in the narrative of my book. Uh, not, not a major character, but he was the son of the sheriff of Shelby County, Alabama, just south of Birmingham. And in fact, in the very late 1890s, he was the chief deputy sheriff in this little town out in the country. Uh, and he and his father were in the business of capturing black men and selling them into the new slavery that was then metastasizing across the South. Now, on the other hand, he was also a sensitive boy. Uh, and, uh, and so in the summers, he would organize his friends and perform Shakespeare. Uh, and, another of the sort of bizarre contradictions of, of that period of time. Uh, and after, and his, but his father was elected sheriff uh, through a fraudulent election in the late 1890s. Um, and then when, his, when he was unseated because of the fraudulence of the election, it was after that that Walt Hall finally decided to pursue his great ambition to be an actor uh, and realized that, uh, that and, and quickly realized that movie making was, was this extraordinary phenomenon and he eventually headed to California and next thing we know he hooks up with, with Dixon and Griffith and becomes the star of Birth of a Nation, which I, I find to be just an absolutely, impossibly amazing irony. Um, the other one quick thing I'll mention before we see some clips here is that Another part of this that I think is somewhat, that we lose track of sometimes, is that in addition to the way that Birth of a Nation was the ultimate manifestation of this process of creative effort in other mediums that, uh, that finally arrived in the film in 1915, the other part, the stage play part, I think is very important in the way that, particularly for a group like this, that I think has an interest in, in some of these aspects of the, of the artistic development, uh, is that it was a, not only was it staged with a different score than the one we heard today, but it was also staged with a dimension of live theater. So that during the original presentations of, of Birth of a Nation, there would have been people behind the screen uh, actually firing pistols uh, at the time of the pistol shots going off in the battle scenes. There would have been a number of, of tactile, uh, three-dimensional kinds of sound effects and, what, and noise effects and smell effects that you would have also experienced. And some of that was, so what we really were seeing then was the emergence of the stage play directly into film. And there was this period of time when, when, they, when they, they existed in, in the same space. Um, and a similar version of that that did not make it into film was the great stage show of the Wild West show of Bill Cody. Now the reason I bring that up was that that had also been in the 1880s and the 1890s one of the biggest theatrical and entertainment phenomena in the country and around the world. There were really tens of millions of Americans who encountered the, those, those pageants, uh, these, these sort of spectacle performances, um, which were all rooted around a very similar notion of white supremacy and the logic and reasonability of using enormous violence, genocidal violence, to solve a problem 
of an ethnic minority. That's really what those presentations were about, except in that case it was all about massacring Native Americans. Well, there was a, there, I believe there's a, a, a significantly minimized or not full, yet fully understood connection between the way that Americans generally came to accept the idea of massive violence against an ethnic minority partly through the experience of the Indian Wars in the West uh, and the idea that we, we became accustomed to the idea that it's reasonable to murder large numbers of people as a response to their inability in our perceptions to fit into mainstream society. And so the Wild West shows of Bill Cody advanced that idea. At the same time, you also had a huge number of Union veterans of the Civil War who were sent out west to kill Indians afterwards. And so you had a, a population of soldiers who during the Civil War fought what they had come to believe was a war of idealism and emancipation, but who then found themselves in the West fighting what was very much so and very clearly a murderous war against a particular ethnic subset. And I think that that found its way back into the mainstream ideas of, of, of how African Americans were th then perceived and treated as well. The, um, before we see these clips, the other thing I'll point out about Dixon, the, the novelist, was that um, he loved reversals. He loved character reversals, theme reversals, fact reversals. He loved to play tricks, very specific tricks with facts. Um, and so, and, the, and Birth of a Nation is full of them. He did it in his novels as well, where in fact one of, the, one of his main novels, he took many of the names of the characters in Uncle Tom's Cabin and appropriated the names of those characters and then populated his novel with those characters with the same names, but then he reversed the good and the bad of each of those characters. So the good guy in Uncle Tom's Cabin becomes a villainous figure in a Dixon novel. And, and he, loved, he loved the way that these things worked, and he loved the fact, um, this idea in particular that Abraham Lincoln had actually been a great friend of the South and that he was actually a white supremacist and the, the, what Professor Blight referred to of that had he lived, things would have turned out very differently uh, and that somehow, uh, somehow the, the, the assassination of Lincoln, rather, rather than that being one of the great crimes of the rebellion, that that in fact uh, was a great crime against the rebellion and against the southern states. So he loved those reversals and he had to have relished the fact uh, that after the Klansman, his play, after it came out uh, and as it began to tour the nation and, and had millions of people coming out to it and it spawned terrible race riots in many places including in Atlanta uh, and, and after this was happening he, he had to have loved because he featured it often in the promotions for the play was that the one surviving son of Lincoln at that time Robert Lincoln who was also a ter who was in fact a terrible white supremacist uh, and that Robert Lincoln was an endorser of the play, an endorser of his books and all of this thinking. And so he'd love to bring that up. But before we, hear the, before we see this quick clip, which I think hits some of these reversals, but I'll rattle off ones that I just scribbled down while we were watching the film this morning. And the first one is Lincoln. Lincoln as a Southerner, as the best friend and defender of the South. Uh, Stoneman, our union guy, the Thaddy Stevens, that we're, and this has been discussed as well, but where it's it's the union guy who's the lecherous white with lust for black women, it's as opposed to the white southerners who were in fact the people with the long record of lust and rape for black women. Union soldiers as rapists and the immoral, in the immoral figures. Southern slaves cheering southern troops rather than hoping union troops would liberate them. Sherman burning Atlanta when in fact it was the Confederates who burned Atlanta as they fled uh, Atlanta before Sherman arrived for the most part. Um, abuse of blacks abusing the voting process and you know, the one scene of the guy sneaking the second ballot around and putting in the idea that it was blacks who were double voting as opposed to the reality which it was whites grossly abusing the voting process. Even in the scene where we see at the end we see the Klan lynching Gus but earlier in the movie we see a, a lynching, we see a black man dragged away from his home tied to a tree and then whipped but it's black people doing that to a black person rather than whites. Whites denied access to the courts, that scene where you have the black magistrate and the black jury. Uh, we don't really know what the dispute is, but a white family ends up thrown out of their home as a result of it. And of course, it was African Americans who were universally uh, denied access to the courts, not whites. Vigilante violence over and over again by blacks, not by whites. The Ku Klux Klan doesn't hurt the black guy in the first scene when they go to the house, but then it's blacks who shoot and kill the first Klansman. So the, not the Klan draws blood the first time. And then finally, 
the, the, the biggest reverse of them all, and that is that the nation was the victim in the end. And this is underscored, I think, by one scene that you'll see, I think the first one, where we see the first two deaths of the Camerons and the Stonemans of the sons of the families, and they're both killed simultaneously in the same battle, and the second son falls in a rather erotic scene almost as he dies, um, you know, and wraps his arm around, uh, around the other soldier, and then they expire in this sort of loving embrace of a really odd, odd scene. But, the, but all the way through this idea that in the end it was, it was whites of the North and the South who were the victims of black freedom as opposed to the idea that African Americans had been the victims of American white supremacy. And so with that, why don't, uh, why don't we see those clips and I think you'll see some of the references I've just made.
And the, the last thing I'll, um, uh, I'll say as I go is that the, the other point I'd strongly like to make about, uh, about a film like Birth of a Nation is that uh, it's, it's not in any manner an entirely historical phenomenon. Uh, obviously, it's a part of this, this historical context that we're talking about, but the economic consequences that I was discussing before are very much so manifested in the society we live in today. Uh, and I argue strongly in my book, and I would today, that, uh, that, that the reality of this new kind of slavery, what I called neo-slavery, uh, that returned in such force at the beginning of the 20th century has much more impact in terms of sculpting the, the economic conditions of America today than the antebellum slavery that we know so much more about. And in fact, there are thousands of Americans alive today, African Americans, who were born on farms in the 1920s and the 1930s uh, into a state of de facto slavery. And the idea that, that the lives of those people and those economic conditions and the ideology of birth of a nation very much so shaped those lives and the lives that we lead today, I think is very real and palpable. Thank you very much. All right, um, welcome to um, the reward to follow, what you just saw, a series of rewards, which is these um, remarkable people encountering each other. Um, so if they're really going to be, um, I'm very curious as to questions each of you may have to ask each other. Um, and the other thing I'm curious about to get, you know, one started is where his, you know, take it as you wish, um, historically, politically, um, cinematically, aesthetically, where are we now? What, we know what we see, what shadow is this still casting and in terms of our discourse, our representations have, you know, in what ways might we be breaking somewhat free? Uh, Michelle and I were whispering at one point before, and she said, oh, God, it's still everywhere. It's all over us. There's no cinematic answer yet. But politically and historically, this is just as interesting. I mean, here we are. So I think I'd start with that, and then I'd love you to ask each other questions. Well, I just wanted to throw some more things out. It's sort of the opposite of of what you're asking for in terms of the now, I feel more of a need for the historical and realizing all the things I didn't get to mention because it's hard. For instance, um, the series of Edison films, which was put out by Kino, uh, the Museum of Modern Art is a major holder of silent films. That's one thing I wanted to say. The silent film period is a very long um, and very elaborate and extensive period in which Birth of a Nation is obviously one of the landmarks, but it is by no means the only one. And uh, first of all, it's a long and varied period, about 30 years or more. And second of all, or longer than that, uh, actually, yeah, 1898 is really when it starts. It doesn't start with Birth of a Nation. It starts well before. Birth of a Nation is kind of one of the first peaks of the, of the feature film. And the Museum of Modern Art is a major holder of silent films along with the Library of Congress. Uh, one of the major collections, concentrations of films other than D.W. Griffith, who has a very, very opus, and it's, it's worth looking at to think about this film, is, uh, are the Edison films, the Thomas Edison films, of which um, the great news is that now there is a DVD set that's been issued. I'm not just mentioning this because I'm included in the interviews on it. But and one of the th rare things about it is also that race is really foregrounded in the discussion. Because a lot of times in silent films, it's not apparent uh, what is being said about race in a silent film. That's one of the reasons why the birth of the nation, it's very important, I think, that people look at it and continue to talk about it, no matter how um, absurd it may seem in some ways. I, I, I can't come away from this day convinced that it's important to see it, it's in, important to understand the music, the context, the film, etc. So anyway, the Edison films are little films and they help for you to understand that. Um, how this develops. There's another series coming out with Kino. They're called the Gaumont films uh, from France. And there's a, a filmmaker named Alice Guy Blachet 
who is one of the filmmakers who did a little film called The Fool and His Money, which is another black, we, we're discovering race films all the time, black cast films. This is a black cast film. We don't know how to classify it. Most of the stuff on race in the silent period is very difficult to classify. Jacqueline Stewart is one of the key people in migrating to, my, great book, classic. E, a brilliant scholar on the subject. So anyway, I, I'm just saying that I already told you about Uncle Tom's Cabin. I already, what else did I already mention? It seems like there's one other thing I want to mention. Oh, that's it. Alice Guy Blaché, French cinema. Each uh, major national colonial power has its own cinematic history. Silent film is a global discourse. They're constantly overlapping each other. And one of the major things they do is they go where there are people of color. Because they're always looking for things to make films of that will be intrinsically interesting. What's intrinsically interesting without sound or music? Yeah, you can even see traces of the mulatto in um ways in which Josephine Baker is directed in, in her movies. You know, Lydia Brown's frenzied seizures. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to be reasonable about precedence. It's just, it could be just a visual connection or some little quirk of sound. Right. And you just go from, from Martinique to Josephine Baker, of course. <laughs> well, in terms of connecting the kinds of representations that we get in the birth of a nation to the now. We talk, I mean, there's often a lot of focus on the way that the birth of a nation foreshadows and anticipates representations of African Americans. But one representation that really resonates with me is the way that the birth of a nation uh, centralizes imperiled white womanhood. And I think that that's a theme that resonates for us in this country consistently, whether it's the longevity of the Jean Benet Ramsey case and how long we paid attention to that because it was this you know, young, blonde, imperiled, young white woman, or even the more recent case of this young woman who was kidnapped, whose name is escaping me, but she was you know, found in a backyard. And Thank you, exactly. And so I think that, that stories like that are really captivating in the American imagination. There's a kind of cultural appetite for these stories about imperiled white womanhood, uh, whether it's, you know, and it's not to say that these aren't legitimate stories, it's just to say that there's an appetite for it that's sort of in excess or that uh, sort of, that sort of takes, it takes a, a tone from the kind of hysteria and, that we and see in the birth of the nation. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would say a couple things to Margot's challenge uh, about where, where have we come. And I, I know today is all about the idea of the relationship of history to the arts, to cinema, uh, to representation, as it should be. But there's also a, a separation here we're thinking about. We have come an incredibly long way since Birth of a Nation in historical understanding, in schooling, in textbooks, scholarship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not here to celebrate how far we've come necessarily because I'm the first one to admit there's a huge distance between the history we write, especially in the academy, and popular memory. In many ways, it seems to me we've come a great distance from Birth of a Nation, witness the shock, the sense of weirdness of any young person who first sees this. But we have not come so far, it seems to me, and I'm just guessing out loud here, uh, from uh, Gone with the Wind in its deep and beguiling impact on basic assumptions and perceptions of that era of American history. I just had an experience that's very weak, a uh, very short version. I, my center gives out the Frederick Douglass Book Prize and one member of this year's jury, who is an African-American woman who teaches in California, and I'll spare you the context in which this came up, but in our long discussions of which book to pick, she said, uh, that when, and she teaches at a prominent college in Southern California. <laughs> Rita Roberts, she teaches at, uh, at Claremont. Anyway, Rita said, she, sent, she does this class on, and it really is race, history, and the arts. 
And she sends her kids out into the, the Southern California community to kind of just do these off-the-cuff surveys. Uh, what do you think about this? What's the first thing you think about the Civil War? The first thing you think about slavery? And she says they come back year after year after year talking to people who somehow still have their heads and gone with the wind. That the South was abused in Reconstruction and so on and so on. We can't carve that out. It, we've been, what, three generations of scholarship now that has just obliterated Gone with the Wind. But culturally, that's what I mean by the separation here. Cinema's power, uh, the methods, the modes, of, of, and, but also weaknesses in what it can and can't do with history are different from, from the history we write, the history we teach. But God knows, we're talking about popular memory, which is reached by cinema, far more often than it is by scholarship. And one last quick thing, Kevin Wilmont's film is brilliant. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. We screened it at my center up at Yale with tremendous response, and it did play here in the village for Very briefly, a couple which, months. Was, which uh, was gonna be my point. I mean, we yeah. do have these great- and it got out in two or three other cities, and that's about it. We have it. this great work that's coming out by independent black filmmakers, but yeah. it doesn't get seen that much. So yeah. is it, have we come far? Sure, if we're allowed to have the same exposure that, yeah. you know, the white, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg's and um, even Ken Burns has. I mean, we have our own interpretations of history and we have our own interpretations of stereotyping that we would like to be seen in the same kind of context, but it doesn't happen. And Kevin's film is a perfect example of that. I'm working on a script right now with some really interesting people, and if any of you would like to invest in it, then talk to me immediately after the presentation. <laughs> work, work it, work it. It's about commerce, it really is. I mean. But it's true. Uh, to, that, to the uh, issue of distribution, um, Urban World Film Festival, it's 12th, I believe, is taking place this weekend. And while we're talking about historical representations of, of African Americans and of America through African Americans, uh, there are a huge amount, a treasure trove of films being shown through this festival uh, that you should accord yourselves to and treat yourselves to because, because it's a festival, that might be the only place you see them if you don't go there and or uh, get to the website and get the list of the films and organize screenings of these films. I think that's one of the ways you can, this weekend. Yeah, yeah we're here, but you know, we can be co-tournaments too, you know. Uh, so I think the thing of is, you know, uh, Martin Luther King uh, talked about how we can avoid uh, a high blood pressure of words and an anemia of deeds. And uh, in terms of how we can be proactive about getting these representations out of the shadows is to become active audiences. That's one of the terms of, you know, modernism that the audience has a greater burden uh, than they did prior to modernism. And so uh, you understand that there's a role you all can play. Uh, I think we'll get to see more. Uh, in your book, uh, Race and Reunion, you cite a number, a, a specific figure around the number of books that have been written about the Civil War, some astronomical figure. It's between 65 and 70,000 books. It's more than one a day since the Civil War. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, re I remember that. Now, <clears throat> it's... And about a third of them are on Lincoln. <laughs> it, seem, it, seems, it seems to me that uh, none of these books, or let's put it this way, not enough of these books are dealing with the K through 12 issue because um, as you well know, as, uh, as a university professor, no, no, no. Or, and um, as I do, much of what we do in the classroom is a process of getting students to unlearn a lot of mythology. And not only do we, get to un we have to get them to unlearn it, we have to debate with these people <laughs> who so believe this stuff. So 
What about that K through 12 divide and, and what to your knowledge is being done among um, historians uh, in the academy around this? Well, one piece of good news on that, uh, I, I heard a comment here saying nothing's been done. You, you, may, you may be a teacher, I don't know. Student. student, oh, okay, <laughs> all the better. And a very good one, too. Uh, she didn't have to unlearn anything. Right? No, no, <laughs> not her. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, many of you know this, there's a huge phenomenon of teaching summer institutes for secondary teachers, middle school teachers. There are hundreds of these now. The Gilda Lehrman Institute here in New York, in particular, has been a leader in this. I've taught these things now for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years, hundreds and hundreds of teachers. But, it, but, but your point is well taken there, too, because we get teachers in who are, who are 23 years old or who are 63 years old, and they come from very different backgrounds, different kinds of education themselves, and are still themselves unlearning certain things to learn other new things. They all love the Underground Railroad, though, I must tell you that, which I, I think is the and deepest. And the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, <laughs> and the Tuskegee Airmen, they know about that. But, but everybody loves the Underground Railroad now. Uh, we, were all, we were all conductors, in case you didn't know. We were all abolitionists in America. Just look at children's literature and Harriet Tubman. I mean, Harriet Tubman's the most ubiquitous figure in children's literature, but it's a certain kind of Harriet Tubman, isn't it? It's, it's Aunt Harriet who just helped people. She's just nice to everybody. She didn't, didn't shoot nobody. She right? didn't carry guns and beat you over the head if, she, if you didn't go with her. Right, right, right. But, but, but so there's, there's some good news on that, but scholars have to get involved in writing textbooks, and a lot of them do. Uh, but you know, there's still this, again, I would just say it one last time, and I'll shut up. The distance between history, the history we write, the history we teach, and memory, the public popular memory is vast. And always remember, there is far, far, far more public memory than there is any history we can create. And that public memory evolves from family, it evolves from region, from church, from going to a museum, from stories from grandmother. We all love our grandmothers. We all believe our grandmothers. We should probably start not believing our grandmothers as well as our teachers, but, but popular memory is what we write for and teach against every day. You got a lot of those. Yeah, a lot of, got a lot of things. Um, we can go to the questions very shortly, but let me also just ask, um, following, that are, is there anything that um, any of you feel you left out that you really do want <laughs> to drive, <laughs> throw out to the audience, or uh, again, to ask, ask each other? Ask question of you. Oh. Bill, right? Yes, Bill. How hard was it for you to make this happen? I'm just curious. I mean, you know, I'm not aware of there being a lot of programs. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be glad. No, I'd be, I'd, I would be glad to answer that question and, and happy to answer it. Um, the beginning of this year, uh, I participated in a panel on uh, a critique of the inauguration. And uh, Karen Cuone um, and the Vera List Center um, invited me to be part of that. And subsequently, maybe what, a month later, or a couple of weeks later, was a party at Karen's. You know? And this is how things work. You got to go to parties. <laughs> um, and um, the party, I was the last guest in the house. And, you know, I don't know if it was the brandy or the, or the brilliance of the suggestion, well, but um, I had talked with uh, Karen about my desire uh, and my realization uh, upon a suggestion on the part of my wife, uh, who's here, Noliwe Rooks, uh, um, that I needed to resuscitate um, a race and representation course that I started teaching in the, when I had my first job in the academy at the uh, uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. 
And I didn't feel there was an audience for it here. Because the, the new school is, is managed by people who believe that class trumps race. And uh, I, I, I didn't feel it would be uh, the right time for that. But the Obama effect uh, revealed, didn't cause, but the Obama, the Obama effect revealed that there were students, two of whom I quoted at the beginning, who were frustrated with this ideology that class trumps race in the new school and beyond. And so I brought this up to Karen, and Karen talked about the fact that there was this uh, theme on contemplating change. And after I explained to her why um, well, the class I wanted to do was going to be centered around the birth of a nation. And of course, she, you know, she had the reaction that most people, why that film? And uh, <laughs> it's not going with the wind, right? Um, I explained to her how foundational it is and how much of what confuses people in this country about this national dialogue on race that I, I hasn't happened yet, as far as I'm concerned, is rooted in this film. Um, and she said, well, look, let's, let's talk about doing this as a, a program this year. And so um, several phone calls later, we had you, we had David, we had Miriam, we had Douglas. A couple phone calls later, we had Michelle. But the, first, the person who um, I think had more to do with uh, making this proposal make sense uh, is Margot Jefferson. It's when we met with her. <laughs> That's really not true. <laughs> but um, th it really, um, it really um, was um, inspirationally uh, a seamless process, you know. And I think that um, the te the testimony to um, how necessary it is uh, as a program um, is is in the people here today. I mean. Karen was concerned that only 25 people would show up on a Saturday afternoon. Well, I'll tell you yeah. one thing. I don't know if how many of you have been here throughout, but when I walked into the screening, I was taken aback. It seemed like it was full. It was about, it was about 200 people easily. Yeah. yeah. And so I, that surprised me because mm -hmm. I know how people usually feel about silent film. How many of you saw it for the first time? Wow. wow. That's impressive. Uh, in that case, you know what? We're going to go to some questions. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, do the old card shuffle. And also, whoever has handwriting, it's more easy. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, Can you your mic? What? Sorry. Yes. What's the, what's the significance of the most thoroughgoing villain being a mulatto in relation to the... I'm not quite sure what this word is. Um, insults, villain, something directed at Obama. Vitriol. Vitriol. There we Thank go. You. Um, directed at Obama. Oh. Say that again. Uh, what's the significance of the most thoroughgoing villain? Villains, let's say, um, Silas and Silas Lynch and um, <laughs> Lydia being a mulatto in relation to the vitriol directed at Obama. Well, I'll jump in on that briefly. Uh, I mean, one thing is just simply that the mulatto uh, of 1915, 1910, 1900, I mean, that was an incredibly resonant uh, character and, and an element of, of art and political discussion at the time. Uh, race mixing specifically was, you know, that, that was the, 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 the evil holy grail, whatever that would be, the cardinal sin of all possible things. Thomas Dixon, who I was talking about earlier, was obsessed with miscegenation. Um, and you, you have, and, the, and later in the film, you have uh, 
you have the legislature passing the uh, the law allowing black white marriages and uh, and the scene of all the legislators looking at the whites up in the gallery and the pretty two, two pretty white girls and they scurry out you know i mean that and i think it's also part of the degree to which that I mean, the sexuality of this film, I think, is, is fascinating and bewildering. I mean, it's amazing how much of the movie is about sex in one way or another. Uh, and, and, of course, all of that is also rooted in the other great denial of, uh, of the white South, and that is the degree to just how much sexual activity there always was in slavery and after slavery between whites and blacks, uh, as evidenced by the range of complexions in the room today. Uh, <laughs> exact, and so, exactly, and, the, uh, and so th th that, it, this, it was one of the most visceral um, uh, elements of the discussion at the time, uh, and now exactly how to bring it into the uh, into the Obama discussion is is complicated. Uh, but and on the one hand, it's um, I think it's probably a fact that a darker skinned African American probably would have would have encountered other reactions, more negative reactions that perhaps Obama did not from some quarters of the of the electorate. Uh, at the same time, it's also sort of astonishing that a, that a mixed race a uh, uh, politician had the success that he did. I mean, there's a sort of positive and a negative at the same time. Uh, but, but the issue of race mixing is one of the most fundamental, uh, volatile, emotional issues in American life through our entire history, obviously. I would add to, to not only skin tone uh, eliciting a different reaction, but uh, someone being a descendant of slaves mm -hmm. eliciting a different reaction and probably not being elected. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just like to add, I think that um, Obama has in fact um, been privileged not to receive as much of the vitriolic um, response as Michelle Obama has because of her skin color. And if you notice, a lot of the, the really negative, violent imagery as well as, as outspokenness has been directed at her. And, and I'm think, I think that is a true testament to the fact that we have not had this dialogue about race in this country today and um, why we still have such responses to um, President Obama and the I First Lady. I want to add just a little bit to the, the question about the significance of the, some of the more negative black characters in Birth Being Mulatto. I think there's something arrogant about it as well, the assumption that the regular black people were sort of content with their lot and were faithful souls and were willing to sort of stay on and you know have no agenda of their own. And it took the infusion of white blood then to give them a sense of ambition, to give them a sense of you know their their own depressed lot. You know, it took this sort of infusion of white blood to make them self-aware in a way that we know for a fact that's not in, that's not really what it took. But there's so there's something sort of self-serving even about this 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 argument that it's the mulattoes that are ambitious. You know, it's something very very arrogant and self-serving about that idea. I don't want to start any trouble. <laughs> oh, sure you do. Yes, Michelle. you do. <laughs> sure you do, Michelle. But I just would really like to suggest that you read the two Dixon novels from which this work stems, The Klansman and The Leopard Spots. I think it sheds a lot of light on what Dixon intended by the whole mulatto um, uh, figure and um, racial mixing. I mean, to some degree, for these people, if there hadn't been any racial mixing, it kind of, there isn't any problem. The whole problem stems from the fact of this intimacy and transgression of boundaries between the races. Racial separation solves the problem. One other thing I always well, have slavery to... was not a situation in which the races were separated. So you see how schizophrenic this is. Because right. they weren't separated in slavery. So where are we going back to? We're not going back to anything. One observation I always have to make when any version of this topic comes up, uh, one of the things I love about Annette Gordon-Reed's book from last year, The Hemings of Monticello, uh, which mm -hmm. elaborates on the, on the story of, of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, um, reference yeah, and the and the uh, one to me. She just won the Frederick Douglass prizes of two days ago. There you go. Well, congratulations wonderful, to her. Wonderful work. 
Uh, but one of the wonderful things about finally having a fuller story of, of that relationship um, is that, of course, there were quite a number of children uh, who were born of the liaison between Jefferson and Hemings. Uh, and several of them, the ones that we know the least about, the reason we know the least about them is because they were so light-skinned. Uh, and so once they, once they turned 12 or 13, they just ran away and, and in a sense, became white people. Um, now, what's so marvelous about that to me, the irony that is so marvelous about that, is that what it means is that today there are thousands of Americans who don't know that they are, one, direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson, and two, that they're black. Which, I just love that. Which, which is the former governor of Louisiana, I found that out. <laughs> yeah, which is perfectly summed up in the last line, or close to last line, of a Charles Chestnut novel, in which, uh, novella, Paul Marchand, in which two characters, after a very traumatic life as light-skinned Negroes, cross the line together, and, and um, Chestnut writes, Wish them well. They deserve to be happy. <laughs> but, but if you go, but if you if you go to Monticello, which which my wife and I did uh, a year or so ago, they are still in denial. Mm. Not entirely. Oh, oh no, they have they, they have they have this uh, the tour we took. Interestingly enough, <laughs> was. Um, was led by an African-American woman, and at every step, every word coming out of her mouth, she was cutting her eye over at us. Like, and we get to the room where the, where the silhouette of who they say we believe is Sally Hemings. She, right, right, right. She goes into this very clear, canned disclaimer that puts an asterisk mm. around what has already been proven. Oh. Wow. Even it, on that particular tour. And then in the brochure that comes with it, more details connected to that asterisk is in the brochure. I am sorry to hear that. I'm on the board of African American Interpretation at Monticello. I go to a meeting there every year where this entire story is being you know, revised and rewritten as we speak. And there's some very talented people working on it, but I'm going to tell them your story. Tell them my story. The next meeting is, in fact, in October. Because uh, this, is, this has changed markedly from what it once was. It used to be that Mr. Jefferson's people were never even discussed. You know, uh, uh, Sally in particular. Um, I'll, I'll pass this on. Good. Also mentioned that she was underage and the president right. Jefferson would be locked up under Vegas law mm -hmm. if that came out the <laughs> She was 16. Okay, Maybe a, few, 15. a few more questions. She was six, ooh, 16, 15, yes, and pregnant when she came back from Paris, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so few people, and this actually seems to connect to some of the historical, well, the repercussions um, of what we're talking about. So few people see Birth of a Nation now. Is it futile to build arguments about historical mythologizing on something so little known? <laughs> well, I think it should be better known. But on the other hand, I do think I'm thinking as we're talking, it's just impossible for everybody to be equally conscious or conscious in the same way. In, in some ways, it, it scares me, the idea that we would all agree about any of this and what that might mean. So therefore, I mean, it's in the nature of consciousness that people should be at different levels. You can't start out at the end. I mean, there would be no reason to live, really or to have innocence and so forth. So the point is this. The point has got to be to open up discussion and allow debate and allow people to be wrong, unpopular, to disagree and to dissent. If it is a matter of we all have to read it the same way, then I'd rather we didn't watch it. I think a testament to how many people were here today to see Birth of a Nation is indicative of how much we do need to show it and talk about it. And that now maybe perhaps is the time to do so, that people are more open and willing because we do have a black president and first lady to, to bring it out into the open and to have the, the dialogue that has been lacking for so long. But, but, but you know, I, I, I 
perhaps David or, uh, or, or anybody on the panel would know, what are the fundamental questions required um, for, uh, to achieve citizenship for uh, someone trying to achieve citizenship in this country? It's, it's near test. There's a test, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Exam. All right. All right. right. Anybody have a sense of what, what's on that exam? Never had to take it. <laughs> All right. Now. now why? Here, here's why I'm here's why I'm bringing it up because your point was, <clears throat> I had a point like yeah, you had no, 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 no. Your point was about reading everybody reading uh, either the same thing the same way. I don't think that's the issue as much as there are there's information um, and so-called knowledge that's considered fundamental, which is part of the reason I brought up this K through 12 issue. Now, um, if there's fundamental issue, uh, knowledge and information that's required to get, K through, get through K through 12, and if there's fundamental knowledge that someone who was not a citizen of this country has to have in order to become a citizen of this country, that, <laughs> then, then yeah, they have to watch it, they have to know it, among other things, there's certain things that they have to know. Like we, we were talking as the panel was assembling, um, that we're in this period of time where you know, all is flexing around First Amendment rights of free expression. And these people know nothing to little about the 14th Amendment. I mean, I think it really fundamentally speaks to the point that Bill and Michelle's students made about cultural amnesia, that, you know, we can bounce along as if none of this ever happened and sort of leave it to the, leave it to the, the bins of history, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't affect the way that popular culture is made in this country contemporarily. That doesn't mean that it doesn't affect and infect the kinds of images that we see. That doesn't mean that Birth of a Nation isn't a template in, a, in, a, in ways that are both aesthetic and cultural. And so for that reason, we can't just say, you know, people haven't seen it. That, does, that doesn't negate the effect that it has. Well, I want to know, why is it that we should watch Birth of a Nation, but we shouldn't watch Gone with the Wind? That's what I want to know, because I think Gone with the Wind, the way I got to Birth of a Nation was Gone with the Wind. I grew up going to see Gone with the Wind, um, if you have time I in the stomach, you should see both. I, I subsequently <laughs> read, read the, the book. Re on the but not only that, there's the book by Margaret Mitchell. I mean, yeah, the big difference is Gone with the Wind is about women in a different way from Birth of a Nation. It's yeah. more about male desire, um, whereas it's, it's melodrama. And by the 30s, we've gotten to a point where you can demystify more the sexuality and the process of denying subjectivity to women and to black people to the point where you get this uh, mystical brew of going with the wind, with the sound and the technicolor and all of that. And it's as it's so uh, inscripted or what do you call it? Uh, uh, it's in code, it's so encoded that my mother could take me to see it in the 60s, and we all went to see it in the 60s in the movie theater. And you know something's wrong, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Well, because the, you've never seen Birth of a Nation, and you don't know anything about Lydia or Silas or anything like that. All you know is about Butterfly McQueen and Hattie McDaniels, and I don't know nothing about Birth and No Babies. And isn't she cute? She is cute. Well, and it's also what she died with nothing, with a know, stove, um, that allows you know, you to suspend you know, what's bothering you and go with the force of the narrative. I would What's venture that there are millions and millions of American voters who voted in this last election who still don't really even have a clue why it's so special that one, a Democrat, and two, a black Democrat one, two, or three southern states. They know that that's a fact and that's interesting and important, but they don't really know why. I mean, we're teaching kids now, their first memories are from the late 1990s. Uh, so, I mean, I take the point of, if, if the question was, 
why, why deal with birth of a nation? Isn't it just an arcane artifact? If that's the, I mean, if we were to judge it utterly arcane with no resonance through time, perhaps. We might think of other artifacts that are so arcane, why bother with them? I don't, I don't think we can... Well, yeah. I don't think we can say that with this one. But for my, uh, my, for my money, there's not as much difference between Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind yeah. as, as one might say. And so if Gone with the Wind still resonates, mm. I, you know, it's only Except a couple that. steps over to get to Birth of a Nation. But there, there also, I would throw into this, though, that there are also a lot of other films that probably don't get the kind of attention that they should to this sort of historical accuracy. I mean, I talk about in my book, Cool Hand Luke, um, as a depiction of where, mm. like, almost all of these depictions of... Uh, of these terrible labor practices in the South in the first half of the 20th century in, in the background and in Gone with the Wind where you have, uh, where you have convict laborers after, after Civil War. Well, in Gone with the Wind, they're all white. And in Cool Hand Luke, they're, it's half white and half black. Well, the reality is they were all black. You know, the, there, were, there were almost no white people being sucked into these systems. And that phenomenon extends all the way to as recently as Brother Where Art Thou, you know, where you have a movie about a bunch of convicts in the South, uh, and it looks like a you know pretty uh, diverse you know uh, uh, 21st century uh, you know multiracial party, but that's not how it was. Well, you know, and on that point, production code forbidding certain uh, kinds of interracial contact does between neo-slavery exist black and in white any people form. on screen. They had a production code in the 30s and beyond that didn't exist during birth of a nation's time. In fact, the whole process of, of censorship of Birth of a Nation was a state process. And actually, this film did go through a lot of transitions and percolations around different kinds of local uh, demonstrations. The NACP was protesting it. It, uh, it uh, went through the mill. And the film we see now is not the film that was originally screened. All right, two other questions, and then I've been told we need to end. One, actually, were there white protests? I imagine the Communist Party, yes, against um, the birth of a nation. Were there any others? There were some. There, 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 were, there were some white protests, and there also were a lot of protests of the stage play, the Klansmen. Uh, both of those That's were, right. yeah, and there were, there, and, uh, and, and on the left. But, uh, and at the time, to someone who was observing at the time, that would have looked very significant. Uh, in reality, did, did, what, what, did it really have a dramatic impact or change the course of events, except to the degree that the, that, uh, that the movie did evolve, particularly later? Uh, I, uh, I think that's actually a very meaningful impact. Uh, but in, but in terms of, um, I mean, there were fairly dramatic campaigns uh, attempted by certain people to try to stop both the play and the movie, uh, it, and they certainly did not succeed in stopping either the play or the movie. And uh, it, it played everywhere, and millions of people saw it. Um, another question in terms of media, I think uh, maybe the last is: um, is uh, this? so-called fair and balanced, let's air both sides reporting that um, we get in an absolutely grotesque caricatured form on you know, parts of Fox. Well, I'm just, mm, you know, I mean, but you also get in places, you know, in the best newspapers in the country. Um, you know, we have to give fair and balanced reporting to these books about black inferiority or whatever. Is this an extension, one of the questions was, of that no fault, no blame, you know? <laughs> you, yeah, and it, I think question. it really is. <laughs> of that historical, of the historian's view, no fault, no blame for either the North or the South, we can reconcile that the journalistic, let's give equal weight to both sides, both points of view, is an extension of, of that attitude. It probably is, yeah. Um, and I mean, I, 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 I would take us back even another step to some, the previous question. I mean, one of the things that seems to me, as arcane as this film may become or seem to the next generation, one of its central points is white victimhood. And God, is that relevant right now? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the the, the, the only I mean, we, the right only we want to play the movement victim. against everything Obama or everything government or everything whatever. Is yeah, um, real Americans from Ms. Palin. I mean, the, the white victimhood is deeply a part of our political discourse right now. And, and what, going back to this film gives us a very interesting historical rooting in that problem. And when everyone's a victim, of course, no one's responsible. As, as the journalist on the stage on the sort of journalism question, I mean, I, I, I certainly would say that 
there is this terrible phenomenon now of what I call tie journalism, where it's he said she, he said this, she said that. I can't figure it out. It's a tie. You know, <laughs> that's tie tie journalism, uh, and and that that imbues American journalism, and it's terrible. You know, and and, and, and the whole cult of objectivity, this this false notion that we that journalists can or even should be truly objective. I mean, tr true objectivity means you make no judgment whatsoever, and obviously that's not what we should be doing. We should actually be making uh, informed and reasonable uh, assessments and explaining them. However, I don't really think that's what the tie that, that, that David was talking about in terms of uh, Birth of a Nation is really about. And when you were talking about that what the film ultimately did was create that, that, um, uh, that really there was nobody, nobody was wrong about the Civil War. Well, it, actually, it, it's, uh, the one thing I'd add to that is Nobody was wrong except the slaves, you know, and for yeah. wanting to. If they hadn't free. been here, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. The and first, so, yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and the idea that so so the so I think actually they they are different things. The, the Thai journalism is a real problem now, but the idea what journalists really ought to be doing is counteracting the kind of propagandistic tie that Inherit the Nation really was built around. Are there any right wing filmmakers now making some variation of maybe it yeah. wouldn't even be about race today. I mean, is, is there, are there right-wing filmmakers making films about big government? Or, I mean, I don't know. Are there? there was, I'm not wondering. Now that they murdered the census worker. Yeah. I don't show I mean, those in my curious. class. But, you know, I think, I think uh, prior, uh, yeah, prior to this iteration you're talking about in journalism is something that Martin Luther King talked about in his speech, Give Us the Ballot where he chided, quote, the white northern liberal who is so focused on looking at things from both sides that they choose no side. Uh, so interested in being uh, analytically objective, they are not subjectively committed. To the truth. Right. And I think our president is being uh, misled by those very forces who are so interested in looking at things from both sides that they're not taking a side. Mm. And uh, I think sooner, hopefully, than later, uh, he's going to shake away from that and um, pick a side. And on that. Um, sober, uh, the past is never past note. Um, let me thank um, the panelists enormously. Um, this, is, this was extraordinary. Um, and prepare you for the fact that um, um, take like a 10 minute, no more break, um, and then we'll come back. Uh, DJ Spooky is here and he will introduce Rebirth of a Nation and then we will see it. Okay, thank you again.